What's up, gangsters? How about a whole bunch of minutes of random that are, once again, specifically about my Ming 148 scale Hornet project? Okay, so what you see in here is a bunch of weapons, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about that momentarily. First things first, because I have to establish the story of how I arrived at these particular weapons. And for me, the story is always kind of the critical thing because it sets up the weathering and I really want it to make sense and be authentic. And, I, you know, I really don't want to, I also don't want to do something that everybody else has already done. So that immediately rules out the decal sheets that come with this kit. Um, and, and I also want to make this an extremely roached out and filthy hornet. And so, uh, you know, I kind of had to look around, find a, a, a squadron that I liked, and, you know, just based on the artwork and what was available in, in, in aftermarket decal sheets. And so I ended up selecting VFA 27, the Royal Maces, and uh, ordered the decal sheets. Uh, these are from Afterburner, and this is a really nice package. This is honestly, this is my first time to ever use aftermarket decals, and I'm well impressed. Um, you get, you know, a lot of good reference information that show you all the uh, schemes that you can do. Um, you get, um, you know, really nice, uh, like I said, color, color plates for uh, what looks like to be um, eight different options. So that's pretty cool. Again, you get stencil placement. Um, you know, it's good. It's a nice, it's a nice little thing. Um, and the decals themselves are printed by Cartograph and they're just, they're really nice. I mean, the printing and the registration is fantastic. Like, look at that. You can see, you know, you can read little bitty tiny text. Um, just really good stuff. Um, and you can see I've got, I've got one cut out right there, which I'll explain here in a second. Anyway, so um, that's all good, but then I started looking at a website that is, it's the unofficial Royal Maces website. And it's fantastic. Uh, it's got 20 years worth of Hornet photos on it. And uh, what became clear pretty quickly is that um, you can, it's really neat because you can kind of watch the aircraft get progressively more manky over time. And what was pretty clear is that birds of the 2005 through 2008 vintage, which is what these decals are for, were not super filthy. And I really don't want to do the CAG birds or, or whatever. Um, so I was like, all right, well, that's not kind of going to work. Plus, so anyway, I, 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 as I went through the photos further and further, I discovered that, you know, the latest ones that were taken in like 2019, where the aircraft are really filthy with lots of overpaints and so forth that I like, um, that's, you know, that's what I needed to do. But I have the obvious problem of number one, these decals are for the Kitty Hawk. And at least as of 2019, this aircraft, these aircraft were flying off of the uh, Ronald Reagan when they're not at their home base in Iwakuni. So that's a problem. Then of course, there's the crew names, um, the uh, Mod X number, the Buno, all these numbers, you know, they go to particular aircraft and that's just not going to work. So what to do? Well, uh, this, is, this is what happens. This is, this is where things get nutty for me when I go down this rabbit hole. Uh, so I thought, well, all right, um, uh, instead of doing a past tense actual aircraft, or even a past tense could have been aircraft, which I love doing, I decided, what if I did a future tense could be aircraft? <laughs> so like, let's say 10 years from now, because then, right, 
Nobody knows exactly which aircraft carrier they're going to be on. Obviously, we don't know who the crew names are going to be. I can even incorporate my favorite number 19 and do uh, aircraft number 219. A a as it stands right now, they only have like 13 or 14 birds in the squadron and it only goes up to like 215. But hey, in 10 years, who knows, right? So that's what I've decided to do. And I'm going to use the decals off of this sheet that I can. And for the ones that I cannot, like the Mod X number, uh, which will be 219, the ship number, the crew names, those things, I am going to use dry transfers. For those of you not familiar, uh, that's basically where you have a, it's, it, the uh, art is on a sheet and you hold it down and you scrub over it with a pencil and it transfers to the surface that you're, that you're holding it against. Uh, for those old timers, that's what letter set letters were back in the day. And a lot of model makers, especially railroad modelers, have used those. Anyway, I found a company in Minnesota that does custom dry transfer. And they'll do me a two-color sheet, both black and gray, uh, four by six, which will be plenty of room to get everything I need on it for about 60 bucks. You know, some people might say, well, that's a little bit expensive, but hey, look, I want it to be original. So I'm going to do that. I'm, I think that's going to turn out pretty good. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. I don't have any reason to believe that it won't work. It's just going to be a little bit of time for me to, um, you know, do, design the, uh, the artwork in Photoshop, which is no big deal because it's all just text. Anyway, so uh, I said I'd tell you why this decal thing here is cut out all ragged like that. Well, you can see maybe that there is a decal there. It's got a couple of pictures of the plane and it's Got some arrows and some text. I don't really know what it says, but it's pretty common to see on newer Hornets on the main nose gear door, but it doesn't look like this. It's rectangular, and the little illustrations of the planes are side by side rather than over and under. And I don't know why this one's like that. I've never in any of my reference photos seen one that looks like that. So what to do? Well. Put on the Optivisor, get a really sharp scalpel, and chop it into seven pieces, including the border, and essentially make a new decal. <laughs> and I'm actually pretty stoked with the way that came out. It's not too bad. The other thing that was not on the, uh, on the Hornet is um, this gizmo on the inside of the, this gear door. Uh, for whatever reason, little piece of, little piece of fuzz on there. For whatever reason, Ming did not give you this device that's in that inset. And it's some kind of an antenna according to the Hornet gurus. So I just whipped one up in Fusion 360, printed it and painted it and glued it in there. Now it's supposed to have like an access panel behind it and that also is not included in the kit part. So I just scribed that in there. And this is a pretty common thing to see where it's a slightly different color and has the do not paint warning on it. So I'm pretty happy with this little gear door. I invested, invested way more time in, in it than I expected to. But this is what happens when I free myself from the tyranny of the calendar. I can just go down the rabbit hole all I want. And honestly, that's where I'm happiest. Anyway, you can see in here that uh, I've got the landing gear all done, um, you know, all decaled. They're pretty filthy, which is exactly what I want. The gear doors, that was a pain in the ass to do that red border. And the way I ended up doing it, um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways. But what I chose, based on it being sort of the least of the evils, was to spray, uh, spray everything red, or at least just the border, um, mask it off, kill the overspray with, with some more, um, with just some black so that I would not get a pink haze through when I, when I sprayed the white and it worked out okay. I mean, the masking wasn't perfect, but it worked out okay. And where it was slightly less than perfect, my, uh, magic wash that I had also used on the landing gear, uh, 
you know, did a pretty decent job of sort of hiding the edge and it's not too bad. It's pretty high contrast, but again, that's kind of the look that I'm going for uh, in the in the gear bays. Uh, so, you know, it works. We'll see, I guess, when it's all said and done, if I like it. But, you know, once you, once you kind of get uh, headed down the road, there's a certain point where that's where you're going no matter what. So, anyhow, that's, uh, that's where I'm at with the markings. Now, what that means is also that in 2032, most of the weapons that are included in this kit... Yeah, they're not going to be using those anymore. They even, a lot of them they don't even use now anymore. Uh, so I went off uh, doing research on what kind of, of ordnance this thing can carry. One thing I knew I wanted to do was do the uh, goofy gas thing, where there's a centerline gas tank and one hanging off of the uh, starboard wing, um, which is pretty common because... Uh, the reason for that is that if they hang a gas tank on the port side, it obscures the camera on the FLIR pod, which I've got right here that I need to put some primer on. So, I like that. Plus, I just think it looks cool. And asymmetric loads, honestly, are pretty common, and I just like that. So, I've got it set up for that. I'm going to use one of these uh, AIM 120s on this rail. I'm going to have this uh, 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 AIM 9X on uh, one of the wing rails. And then I've got these things right here. Now, what are those? Okay, so first thing I wanted to do was, all right, what kind of bombs might this thing carry? Well, the venerable Mark 82 iron bomb, which has been around since Vietnam or maybe even before, and has now become the GBU-31, uh, uh, which is turns it into a GPS guided bomb with the kit that they add on for the tail and um, so forth. Well, that's probably, people are saying, that's probably going to be replaced by a new thing called the GBU-54, which is a basically an upgrade of, uh, of that thing uh, to make it a laser guided bomb. And it gets a uh, it gets a like a whole package of electronics um, and a thing on the nose, and it gets a seeker head uh, on the tip of it. Well, I I I could see that uh, Edward makes a GBU 54 in resin, but for whatever reason, because I'm just crazy like that, I decided to make my own. So engineered it up in Fusion 360. Took me about four tries to get the sizing and the shape and everything the way that I wanted it. But this is my GBU-54. And you can see I've got it in three sections. There's the seeker head, there's the tail unit, and then there's the uh, the warhead. And I don't know, I'm going to see how it works to try and texture it. Because with Navy bombs, they have a thermal protective coating on them to keep them from cooking off in the bomb storage area because obviously on a ship, that's bad, okay? So um, we'll see how that works out, but I'm pretty happy. These are all printed on my Epax X1 4K at 10 microns, and I like, I like it. The detail uh, came out pretty good. Hopefully you can see that. Um, there's lots of little bitty features there. The smallest features are down around 0.1 uh, millimeters. Uh, you can see, you know, there's some, some build artifacts, uh, not layer lines, but XY artifacts. And, you know, that's just the nature of the deal. I, I, I feel like that they don't show enough to bother me, so probably just gonna run with that. Um, and uh, so that gets me the a couple of pylons. Um, I'm gonna have a I'm going to have a single one on the outboard pylon on the port side, which is station two. And then right next to it, I'm going to have a, a tandem um, mount. And that requires a rack, a BRU-57, which is this little sled looking thing here that I've got set up where I drilled and pinned to uh, give, the, give the bombs a little bit of a stronger mounting but that comes from res kit and that's this little box i got right here and this is uh 
This is what it looks like out of the box. Um, this was, since I'm only going to use one of them, I used the, the other one for practice uh, fit to see how it's all going to go together. This is my first version of the GBU 54. It's a little bit too small, but it gave, you know, it told me what I needed to do to adjust and figure out how to make the data cable attach in the right spot and all that. This is pretty cool. Uh, you can see it fits in three different parts to make the main uh, portion of it. Um, it's just got this little bitty instruction sheet and you can see that it's got the sled and then it's got these two racks on the side. Uh, the, you know, the detail on these is fantastic. I would really love to know what kind of 3D printer they're using to create the master patterns for these because they really, really are good. But the fit was, was a little tight. I had to do a lot of adjusting to get these two things to fit in their slot right here. There was also some flash in there, which is understandable, that I had to get cleaned out. And then there's a little bitty photo etch bracket and this arm and so forth that I have to uh, also take care of adding on. But, you know, overall, I'm pretty impressed with this little kit. I think this was, I don't know, it was like 15 bucks or something. Um, got it from Sprue Brothers and, uh, of course, came like in just a couple days. But uh, pretty cool, pretty neat stuff. Um, now, the other thing, what I originally was pointing to was this other weird-looking rack. And this is another cool thing. I am uh, certainly no expert on modern uh, ordnance, but I've learned a lot. And what this thing is, is this is the rack for a set of four GBU-53Bs. And that comes from Edward. I did go ahead and use the, the Brassen because not sure anybody else even makes them. But these are pretty neat. Um, so what this is, is this is basically a tiny little airplane bomb that explodes. And it's laser guided and, and bad weather capable and all kinds of uh, gnarly shit that lets you, know, lets you, as a Hornet pilot, basically fly it through the window of a bad guy's technical. Um, it's a 250 pound bomb and each rack carries four. So I'm gonna have one on each side. So there will be eight of them, and that's what all these are that I've got stuck to. Uh, this is 3M double-sided tape that I love for racking up parts to paint. And you can see the detail on these is really, really nice. I mean, they did a great job. Really, really high resolution, super crisp castings. The only thing I found out pretty quickly is... These are supposed to have, there's, there's supposed to be two shackles sticking out of the top of them. And I immediately discovered that they were about half a millimeter too far apart to plug into the holes right there on the bottom of the rack. So yeah, not good fitment there, Edward, not good. But, you know, obviously not a big deal either because I just clip one of them off and use the other one because all it's really doing is uh, giving you fore and aft location. Uh, so not a big deal, nothing to really get fussed about. The other thing that I'm doing on all of these, um, as I said, I, I put pins in this, uh, in this rack for those bombs. And um, I also, uh, I'm not doing it for the GBU 53s because they mount pretty solidly, so I'll be able to glue them on pretty well. And what I did do is I drilled these sleds so that they will plug into the pins that are already in the kit pylons. And it's a nice firm fit, so they slide on there, a little bit of glue, they'll never come off. Then to create a safety and make it easier to mock up and you know if I ever sell this piece to ship it I've magnetized all of the pylons so you can see there's a two millimeter neodymium magnet sticking in there and that mates to a magnet in the bottom of the wing. So speaking of the wing uh, let's take a look at the rest of the airplane and get all this garbage out of the way and uh, show you what's going on there. Um, it's uh, in 
pretty much the same condition that it probably was last time we looked at it. I, I can't remember. But uh, you can see where I have attached the aforementioned magnets. And now that's, you know, honestly, installing magnets is really a pain in the ass, but um, it's challenging and I honestly kind of like the challenge. And I really like the results because, you know, being able to just take these pylons and stick them on there and, you know, not have to worry about them getting knocked off or falling off or whatever, you know, is great for all the aforementioned reasons. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's super useful. So, uh, I like, you know, it is, it's, it's a hassle, it takes a while, but definitely worth it. Now you may be wondering, what is going on with these two 3D printed stubs that are sticking out of here? What's going on with that? So, <laughs> so here's what happened. I put the, I, I dry fit all the landing gear, you can see the nose gears in there. I dry fit all of it and I put it on its wheels just to have a look at it and it immediately looked like one of the tails was way out of whack. Like, I could see from all the way across the room that, it, that, that they did not have equal angle on them, and that obviously was not gonna fly. And the fact that I had just come back from an IPMS contest had nothing to do with it. I, I, you know, I want my shit to be straight no matter what. So then I was like, okay, well that's not good. Um, what the tip of one tail was about, um, uh, was like two millimeters lower than the other one on the uh, starboard side. So I'm like, well, that's not good. So then I set it up on one, two, three blocks and I made myself a little poor man's height gauge by using uh, some more of my favorite magnets, one, two, three block, and this nifty little ruler from AK uh, it's got uh, inches on one side, uh, millimeters on the other side, and the important thing is it's got millimeters on both edges. So you can attach it to the one, two, three block with magnets, just like that. And you got a handy dandy little height gauge and you can put it here, get a number, slide it over here, put the ruler on the other side, if you don't lose your magnets. Anyway, then you slide it over on the other side and get your get your other measurement on that side. So that worked fine. Um, and and what I did then is I is I set this thing up on another one two three block and measured it. And the 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 uh, tail was correct. Looked good, but <laughs> one wing was way low. And I'm like, okay. What's the deal? And it was sitting on the fuselage. I had the one, two, three block so that basically it was sitting right here. And the one, two, three block obviously is true, but what I very quickly concluded is that the fuselage might not be because when I put a level in several different places, I, including across the top of the tails, I got two different measurements. Well, that obviously was not good. So I thought, all right, well, what I really need to do, because if I'm gonna correct this, it's gonna happen in the landing gear. I, we, I just sort of fussed at, at, uh, at, at heating this a little bit with a hairdryer and maybe bending it, and I'm glad that that was not successful because uh, what I found, I, I figured, okay, what I needed to do is get some known references. I need to know exactly what's going on with the landing gear but I don't really know how tall they are. So I made these in Fusion 360 as just basic little uh, stubs that I know the length of. And so when I set the thing on that, then I've got a known set of references. Um, and lo and behold, when I did that, uh, I used, and I used my poor man's height gauge the tails were right, and the uh, and and one wing was just like maybe only a millimeter off. So not only did I breathe a sigh of relief that everything seemed to be okay, but I was relieved that I had not mangled this thing trying to fix something that might not actually be a problem. So that's that. Now in the course of all of that gyration. Uh, yeah, because, you know, tool whore gonna tool whore all the time. I decided to go and buy myself 
a, an inexpensive height gauge because that's just way cooler and way easier. So let's just see. So this is pretty cool. These things are really common in machine shops, but they cost, you know, for a good one from Starrett or Mitutoyo, you will pay at least a couple hundred bucks for one, and I wasn't interested in doing that. So this one I just grabbed on the cheap uh, from our buddy Jeff Bezos over there at Amazon, and uh, it was like $45, uh, which is more... You know, which it, I mean, it'll be it'll be more than than capable of doing what any of us would need to do. So it's pretty cool. You just slide that down. Let's see where this wing tip is. Just barely touch off right there, and it says seventy one point one one millimeters. Actually, I better make sure I'm zeroed out at the bottom and I'm not. So let me zero that. And it really doesn't matter because all you care about is that it's the same on both sides. So touch off there, 45.95. All right, so that's great. So slide it over here. The only thing I don't like is that you can't read it from both sides. Um, but let's see what this side says. We'll just have to flip it around. So we'll go over here. Hang on. Let me turn the camera. All right. So we'll just run it down. Touch off. And then let's just spin it around, see what it says. 48.88. So a solid three millimeters difference. And I don't know that I've got necessarily the uh, the legs are, they may be a little bit out of whack, but you know, at least this way I can get really good measurements and I can satisfy myself that I know what's going on where. And if I need to make an adjustment, then I can at least potentially do that with the kit landing gear. And I can use these reference ones that I made to figure out exactly how much of a change I need to make rather than just, you know, shooting in the dark. So anyway, that's a good thing. And I'm pretty sure that's like 20 minutes of random. So that's enough. Bye.